Hello, everybody. Um, I'm the only one who's going to speak without microphone, so don't worry, it will be short. Uh, the real uh, center of our attention is obviously not me or us or our studio footage, uh, Pascal Flammer. Um, we are very happy to have Pascal Flammer here. He was here the whole afternoon together with Kunrat Dobrir and Yuri Skritis in a midterm jury, which is a delight, I have to say. It was very nice. Um, at the same time, we feel it was a good opportunity today, and it's an experiment. So that's also why we tried to mobilize as much as we could you and try to also find out a little bit, I have to say, how the school works, because we're all new here with our chair. Um, so there's still a lot to learn, it seems like. But um, more importantly, I would like to just shortly explain this. Pascal Flammer's presentation, his lecture, is, is we are, as far as we are concerned, the first, that's also why we call it number zero, in a series of lectures which we call the difficult double. And the difficult double is a very specific set of lectures which, after this one, this semester, will be 12 every week, more or less, in the next semester, in which we ask a very specific, uh, very talented, young, practicing architect who has done uh, a set of important works, in our opinion, to talk on the one hand about his or her work, or the office's work, but also to talk about a specific, in a way, given uh, other architect. Because we believe that architecture that we practice is always in relation to that cultural context. Now, in this case, it was not very difficult to think uh, who we should ask uh, Pascal uh, to talk about. So it felt relatively natural to ask him to debate or discuss, on the one hand, Kazuo Shinohara's work, or some of his works, some of the projects which he particularly wanted to talk about, and his work. So, whether that relationship is direct or indirect is all up to Pascal in the end. I mean, we are very curious to hear, and at the same time we are obviously also very curious to hear uh, his explanation of his own work. Um, at the same time, maybe um, I'm only there still to tell you a couple of elements about Pascal, Pascal Flammer, for the ones who do not know. Uh, we believe Pascal is probably uh, the most talented architect of his generation at this moment in Switzerland. Um, uh, he's uh, a good friend uh, of all of us in the sense that we believe that um, there's a very interesting interchange going on among a set of architects in Europe at this very moment. And we believe uh, he's very much part of that, uh, as some of us are, are too. Uh, he started his practice properly in 2006, um, has before and even afterwards been teaching in many different places, specifically in Andrisio and at Harvard with Valerio Chatti, um, <coughs> and uh, is currently working on a whole set of different projects. I mean, uh, a set of houses, a set of bigger projects. He has been <coughs> awarded a couple of important prizes, among which the Swiss Art Award in 2006, the Weissenhof Architecture Award, and most recently the Best House of Switzerland, for I suppose the house, one of the houses, I think it's actually this picture, he will show to us uh, tonight. Uh, I do not feel I need to introduce Kazuo Shinohara, first of all, because I believe everybody needs to know him. Uh, and apart from that, uh, the other things we are supposed to know, according to Pascal, I hope he will explain us himself. Thank you very much, Pascal, for coming. Um, you very curious. Thank you for the invitation. Can you so, kind of almost completely done with the light. No, no, I need one. We just look at the stuff. about oneness. You see, the walls and the ceiling are of white plaster, there is no joints, and the 
pitched roof actually also helps to make out of the walls and the roof one thing. I would call it one. But it is also about fragmentation, about fragments. You see in the back, there's a piece of stair staircase coming into this space. Actually, the height of the staircase is only the functional height. So it appears somewhere in the space we have a tapete interior, the door that you can hardly see, and the staircase continues and goes somewhere. It's also about material. Due to the contrast of the white plastered wall that has no traces of hands, no traces of man, opposed to the concrete. And I would say the fact of putting it both at the same time, the concrete is very present. It's also about structure. We see a pillar, we see a horizontal beam. But maybe the most, it is about the symbolic space. The beam seems to be in a strange position. Huh? Forces of a roof would have, if it was a straight form of the beam that comes out of the force of the roof, it would have a different form. The pillar itself seems to be over dimensions to hold this little space. And Shinohara, as far as I know, didn't take the picture himself, but he controlled every picture that left his office. So he certainly strongly um, put his opinion on this specific way to look at this space. And we have this pillar in the middle that is so present. And I find at the same time it has a it has a <coughs> presence, but because of its dullness or absence of any um, meaning, kind of, it also leaves us in a, again in, in an absence of ability to read. Next one. This is another space of uh, Shinohara. And for me, it's maybe one of the biggest contrasts I can imagine to the first picture. Here, all is painted in a brown golden painting. Usually, if an architect paints everything in the same color, it's a sign of abstraction. Usually, when an architect wants to abstract, he uses white. Because the white color kind of where all connotation is off. But Shinohara does the opposite. He takes the color that has the most amount of connotation. It's gold. Gold is the color, I think, <coughs> of the, kind of the color of the highest idea of our culture. The churches, the Celt, the Celts will bring out. Gold is the color of symbols and rituals. And Shinohara uses here gold, and at the same time, he abstracts, he dissolves hierarchy. Then there's another thing. Shinohara was working mostly after um, Japan was reconstructed. Japan had a lot of influence from the West, particular, actually, modernist influence. Shinohara was in a heavy struggle with this influence and kind of fighting it. And I find it very remarkable because this is Shinohara's own house that he took back key element, kind of his enemy. It's the standing proportions coming from the West, and it's the 
axial symmetry, huh? the symmetry of the axis. So I can hardly think of a contemporary architect that is so thoroughly living, living you know, opposition. Next one. This is another space for Shinohaga. And with this, I also want to show you this concept of contradictions. I think he combines here the two most principal ways to build or to do architecture. On the right hand, we have the idea of adding elements to make space. Huh? A wall, a ceiling, and then you cut out. On the left side, you have the plasticity. It's about corpses, it's about um, person, the core. And Chino Haga puts it in the exact middle, left the one possibility, and on the right the other oppo opposite to how to build the space. Next one. When I was a student, I saw this plan, and it seems to be a quite normal plan of a second floor, the upper floor of a normal little house somewhere, some bedrooms, I guess, and some bathrooms. And then you realize, or I realized, that there is something very bizarre in this plan. It has two stairs. And not like Le Corbusier or so that would make one stair that is a kind of a ballade through the building and the other one is a shortcut. No, it has two times the same simple, relatively almost shitty stair. And I was wondering, you know, how, how, why does one do two stairs? And I started to fantasize about two stairs and started actually while I was also doing a project as a student, to think about a project with two stairs. But imagine if you have whatever house, and you have two times the same stair, your entire house is completely put into question. It's no more clear if you should go up on the left, if you should go up on the right. Where does it lead to? Why do we do stairs? Just this simple duplication, I find, made out of a house a gigantic universe of unanswered questions. Next one. So this is this project I would like to show and I made out of this topic of two stairs. Next. Um, we were asked to think of our own architecture office, and we were asked to look for a site. I chose a garden in Zurich, surrounded by some nice trees. Next. And this is the project, the model of the project, how it looked at the very end. It's a house completely out of concrete. All pillars and all beams are out of 20 centimeters concrete. Next. It's a building that has three floors above ground and one below ground. Next. I'll show you now how you use this building. Let's say you would work at my office. You would enter here, say hello to the secretary, walk around and take in this stair. Next. So you would enter at this door, walk up the stairs, next, and arrive in that space. You would take somewhere your seat and work on the computer, next. Let's say I would come into the office, or somebody would visit me. I would also take this walkway, say hello, and then take these stairs, next which is a blind stair that goes on the uh, first upper floor, has no openings on the ground on the first floor, so nobody would see me. And I will go further up into the top floor next, and arrive 
here. So me, myself, I would then go enter here into my nice little room. From here on, I could also go to the library, which is here, or on this side to the meeting room with the office. If a guest comes, he would arrive here, either come with the guys from the office and have to call something with him, or he would come to my office. I could go from here on down next. So it would take these stairs going down next <coughs> and arrive in the first upper floor with the working people next. Or of course they could also come up and whatever to me or to this place next. Let me talk <coughs> about the structure of this building. It has a concrete core in the middle around stairs. And these concrete cores are from here on there is four beams. This one, this one, of course this one, and in the back also symmetric this one. This length is around eight meter and this is about sixteen meter. So, just too much to span with a 20 centimeter thick plate. So what happens is, the beam goes, or the ceiling here, goes from here to here, but since it's so long, it actually is bigger in the middle, in order to be able to span from here to here. This plate, this, uh, plate here goes from here to here, and since it's too long, is actually pulled up by a pillar onto the roof. So it's a, a pillar on traction. The next plate, this one here, is hang up in these two pillars here, which are also pillars on traction. And then the only pillar in the middle that is a real pillar on compression. Next one. If you put the three floors on the top of each other, I think it is the three principal floors that we know in architecture. The first floor, this one that is on the ground, is the one where the pillars are in the middle, like the Noguchi lamp or like the 50 times 50 house by me. By putting the pillar in the middle and not in the <coughs> corner, you produce a space with no limits. The first upper floor where you kind of work concentrated on your computer, there the pillars are in the corner, producing a very strongly defined space. The third floor, the top floor, produce a space where you have a back, and with the back you watch to somewhere. This is even exaggerated by this niche idea, huh? this protection behind and then this opening to the front. Next. These are some pictures of the model. Next. Maybe a little thing what I would like to say I think in the first reading, this picture, this building is about kind of some uh, modernist Maison Domino. And in the second reading, you actually realize that it doesn't really work because structurally it's screwed up and it kind of has some memory of whatever, some old architecture on the top. And actually, in the third reading, I find complexity of this building is actually the complex way the space are linked in between each other that you would never imagine that it would be in such a small building. And your intention is mostly kind of mostly thinking of the pillars, but I think the real complexity is actually the connection of space. Next one. Next one. This is a building by Shinohaga. And it is a house. So a house where somebody lives and sleeps. 
I think it's the, maybe the most principled house that has ever been designed. Thinking of what you do in a house. It has basically two spaces. It has a day space and it has a night space. The day space is what you see here in the picture, but also what you see here in plan. It is a form, I mean, the form of the plan is a almost square. So this means it's something. It's not a precise form. It is just somehow occupying some earth. And, but it is on the earth. And by, the, by that, that it's that it is, I mean, it's kind of, I find logic that it's clear that it's close to a square because that's the most efficient. But as soon as you make a square, you, have, you want to also say something about the square. So I find it super logic that it's almost square. And that is maybe the next thing what I like about Shinohara so much. <coughs> Shinohara is maybe the most precise guy about unprecision I know. So, as a consequence also, the kitchen and the bath is just somehow <coughs> added into this almost square. It's part of the bigger space. When it comes to sleeping, he proposes that man leaves the earth, or leaves the crust of our, of our planet living on. He leaves this cross, he goes down into the earth, he leaves also geographically the space, because he doesn't go down and sleep <coughs> below this thing in some kind of a cellar. No, he goes and lives or sleeps in the protected earth. No more light, just surrounded by earth. Here you can see that actually they leave. The floor here is not concrete or wood. It is actually really earth. It's just rammed earth, huh? like a hardened earth. So I find also a lot of it's this idea of, of living on the planet, on this crust. It's just slightly transformed it to make it livable. Next one. Uh, the next project I show you is the uh, house uh, in Liguria. So let's see, I think we have been waiting four years for building permission, but we got it and start in January if everything goes fine. Next. This is a picture of uh, this beautiful road along Liguria. And uh, I realized when I was asked to do this that kind of all new buildings are very ugly. And try to find out why. And I thought that maybe it's eventually because of the Kepi. It's just very ugly plaster that nowadays is being used in these areas. So I started to think, okay, uh, let's uh, think of another material and plaster, next one. <coughs> and as is quite at the mode today, but I also thought, let's do it in this insulation concrete. Uh, to quickly explain to the ones that don't know, on the top <coughs> we have a normal uh, mixture of, uh, of a non-insulation concrete with the fine stuff to the quiet rough stuff, and in the insulation concrete, you just replace the sands with Liabev and the gravels with Liabo. And basically, what those materials do, they just store air. As a consequence, their ability in compression is smaller. So, say a house that can more, more or less insulate according to the Swiss today standards. Um, can only span five hours. Next. After this, I was 
Before now, we formed the house exclusively thinking about the windows. How could they be? And I decided to put all aspects kind of on the concrete itself and therefore produce an opening where you don't feel if you are, if the door is open or closed, but you always have the impression that you live in a ruin. You just live in a concrete place with a complete absence of any finishing, so door for any framing or whatever. As a consequence, the windows here are just frozen put outside, and this is the inner space. Next. This is the site where the thing is going to come. It's a very small little building. It's going to be here next. And this is the view of uh, this place next. Yeah. Um, <coughs> as you see, there are some existing houses. You will achieve it from here. And it's basically a one floor building on one of these many terraces with a lift that goes down to the sea next. And in reality, in some places, it's a bit more complex. It will touch the road, and actually, there's also a sleeping room below. Next. This is uh, an image of uh, how we imagine this building is going to be. And you have to imagine you arrive to this building up here from this walkway here. Very beautiful place, you have some flowers and it smells of some stuff. And <coughs> from here on, you turn and you walk over the building, over the roof, and you see straight <coughs> into the ocean, or into the sea. And then when you're in front of the sea, you turn back towards your left, you take down a quite a big stairs, and you enter kind of a small garden with some lemon trees and olive trees. Next one. This is the plan of the house. <coughs> and I realized that, and I have to say it's just a holiday, it's a little holiday house, huh? Um, that the climate in winter and in summer is quite different. It's quite hot and quite cold. So, what I propose to do is to make one space the main space. But at the same time, I want this one space to be two spaces, which is something that doesn't really exist, right? I mean, something is either one space or two space. But I would want to be it both, one space and two space. So what I do is I just cut it in the middle by doing a slight wall that you know goes a bit inside. And as a consequence, I think it will have twice the same space, once with kind of four windows. That is the space for spring. And on the other hand, it has the summer space that has the same form and kind of no windows or very little windows. So what I like about it is, is this one space that I also have. <coughs> then this room needs a sleeping room or this place needs a sleeping room. And actually I don't want to make a sleeping room. I think it has nothing to do with this house. It's just kind of urgency. You have to sleep somewhere. So I try to do the sleeping room in a way that it is not connected to this one main room. And my thesis is <coughs> that this could work if I do the staircase here starting five steps before it meets that wall. Because as a consequence, if you go down five times 20 centimeters, you're down one meter, so you still need the opening of one meter at that place. And this one meter could look like a chimney, or could look like some kind of opening, you know? You're not, I could imagine, not really remembered of a, of a door, of an exit. It's more like a, somehow 
a big piece that is a big missing in this concrete room. Next. So you go down and come here to room number six. Next. This is a uh, facade. Next one. Custom execution done next. Next. And that is how I imagine uh, the world in this. Next. <coughs> Now I show you this house in Balsa. It's actually the first house and also the only house I did. Next one. <coughs> it is a house in, uh, in the Yuga. So the Yuga is on the border to France. Next one. Next one. You have to imagine this is a. a this place is very beautiful and very boring at the same time because there is nothing but me. You know, if you're living in a city or so, it's relatively easy. You know, I find you don't need really a nice house because you can go into bars, you can meet people, you can go and eat with other people, people and so. But kind of, if you're living in a, in a, in a retreat or in a band place, you somehow need stuff that simulates you, or that, that, that makes you oh, want to <laughs> have fun in life, kind of. So, um, I thought I have to do a house, and if it's okay, I build it. If I can imagine to be able to live two weeks in the house alone, continuously. And what I kind of took as an idea to propose this, since it only has the nature as the only topic, I said, okay, let's produce three different ways to perceive nature. So it has basically three different rooms, the ground floor that is sunk and 75 centimeters into the ground. And um, it's the main space, and it's also kind of the piazza. It's the space that is, I call also, an animalistic space. It's a space where you do not have the control of, over your surroundings. You have to imagine, if for example a cow is around and this can happen, this cow is still like here. Huh? So the head of the cow is kind of here, and you are sitting here. So, it's a space where you do not dominate. It's a space where you just kind of part of it, and you just kind of exhibit it to it. And I find it's also kind of a, a psychological space. It's a space about protection and about fear, because you are, you know, you are not protected. The other space on the top here is completely different. I would say it's kind of the northern Italian space of a villa. It's a space with standing rooms and it's a space where you walk from one room to the next room. And the windows here are only here to look at something. So they're kind of like, like a picture or something. It's a framed view where you have a very distant relation between what you see and what yourself, what you, what you see and yourself and the space by its height, it also produces kind of a, you know, a, a, a spatial presence in itself. So the exterior is a very distant thing. <coughs> in the third space, this is the one that is below ground. It's this one here. Third space is very different. The third space has no connection to the site. It has only a zenithal light, so it's a space that it could be wherever, in, in India or in Sao Paulo, it is a site with no connection to the ground. So and the idea was that kind of when you flip rather quickly from one of these, throughout these three different conditions, 
that these three conditions would be enough, you know, to to uh, to be of a topic and to make an interesting house. Next, let's make a little walk through the building. So you enter the building and you kind of go down into the earth. Next, so you arrive uh, in the building. And here you see, so it has legs at 75 centimeters above ground. That's where you sit. And then the glass is straight on this height towards 230 up next. You see the plan. We are now standing here. And basically all around is made. Next. 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 Next, this is the kitchen. You know, the kitchen is usually at 90 and not at 75, and instead of going up, I decided to go a step down. So we also have 90, that's why it's a step here next. Here we are, are we now in the first, in the upper floor. You see now it's the high rooms, and the miniature is becoming a painting. Next. So we are here, huh? next. And what you see here is the, is the floor plan. And this building has no corridor, or the smallest possible corridor. I wanted that, because I think kind of the idea of a corridor is psychologically very bad. Because usually you go up a corridor and you end up in your room and it's a dead end. I find the idea of dead end is bad for people. So what I propose is the smallest possible corridor, almost kind of in a baroque way, you go up the church, you sneak out, you know, the hidden place, and you go into the big rooms. So what happens is you come up here, you take one of the, these doors, let's say you come into this room, and from here on you are in a new system. And the way you go now from one room to the next, is via doors that are on the periphery. So you walk from here to here to here to here. And it's an endless system. Yes, it's a bit like a goldfish, but it's also a system that is not a dead end. So you can kind of continuously walk. Next. So this is a picture of the door. Um, this is the picture here. Huh? There's another thing. You have to imagine, usually, I mean, by the way, I had to build this ceiling of light because of regulations. So it's kind of a chalet type that I had to take. And usually in a chalet or in these buildings, in these gable buildings, the two long walls are structural and in the front of the gables it's glass because there's no forces. And what I wanted to do that you do not feel any structure in this space, I made a hole in the worst point of the structure, which is the middle of the beam. It's exactly there where you should not, because the moments are the biggest. And I did this in order that you cannot read the building <coughs> structurally. Even though I didn't explain yet how it works, it's actually very simple. It has beams on the lower floor here, and another one here, another one here, and another one here, and of course, these are points. So, this is a very big beam on the top floor, and this is a beam, and the upper floor is a beam. And then uh, the boards are only four meters to carry, so it's, very, it's actually a very simple structural system, it's a very simple constructive system. So, this round is here to destroy the ability to read. It has something else, which I find more and more, and I, I realize this only after construction, it is this, this fragility. You know, the sliding door of this building goes into the glass. And as you see, it's a lot of very fragile connection. It's kind of, this house is almost about to to this, you, know, you can very easily destroy it, just taking out the corner. And I have to say, I find this 
very important. I think we should build more <coughs> buildings that are very fragile. I think we come to a point where you have too many buildings that just can take everything. And I think by this we also start to have no more a physical relation to, to materials. <coughs> Next one. This is another picture of the run next <coughs> the bathroom. Next. This is then actually the fourth floor here on the very top. You can take the stairs up. The guest room, I find it very important if you live, if you live kind of out in the ship, you need a place where you can invite guests. You also need to have guests, otherwise you get lonely. And they need their place to, when they when they ate and get drunk that they can sleep. So it's the place where they leave the system and just fall asleep. It's also the only space in this entire thing that is this single one. Next one. So now we take so it's actually only this place. Now we take the stair down next. Take the stair down here, and we go to minus one next. This is the space that I talked to you that has no connection to the outside. It is actually the same plan as ground floor, just turned 90 degrees. That's kind of the scale of size. And it only has this light that gives some light, but no more. Correlation to outside. Next. So this is the plan. We saw here the building above. I go up to here. Turns. Um, here the tenant will last. Next. Some pictures from outside. Next one. Next one. House. We are planning for a client in uh, Scotland, actually in the north of the Isle of Skye. So the Isle of Skye is in the north, and we we face this Isle of Skye. Next one. This is how it looks up there. There's just some gravels, a bit of moss, no trees, and the other thing, a strong presence of water. And uh, <coughs> this water is actually then going into the sea. And again, here, <coughs> kind of the topic of this house is what is there. And what is there is basically stone and water. Maybe as a Swiss, I have a quite pragmatic relation to stone, to rock. I mean, it's just, it has this very physical rock thing. But I have a very, maybe, un, well, a strange relation to water. But I find the ocean is kind of a, <coughs> kind of a concept for me, huh? because the ocean has no end. The ocean is, 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 is always a model of something. I know oceans from this idea of a globus, that it somehow goes on. But I don't really, I mean, I don't, I cannot really physically understand an ocean as well as good as I can understand a rock or a stone. So this building is about these two natural elements, water and stone, with a very different, let's say, perception in our heads. Next. <coughs> so, what I propose is two spaces. One space is this one. It's the space for the rocks. It's actually just kind of a land art idea. It just gives a perimeter to an endless surface. It just defines.
find who seems to be hitting this wall, wheel, wherever it is, the top, I mean, wherever it is, it's the rock is on the top. And then there is another space, it's this one. And it's very difficult somehow to make a space that is about a model, you know, about a model of something. And I propose here now a space that normally I would never do. It's the space of the half circle, exact half circle. I'm quite sure it's a, it's a nightmare of a circle, of, of a space, because you know, in half a circle, you first of know, first of, first of all, you know that it's in architecture not possible, only mathematically possible uh, to build a real half circle. And the second thing, also, I think a half circle should either be a bit more than half a circle, so you are a bit uh, gefasst, you know, you're a bit hold, held by the space. Or it should be a bit less than half a circle, so you're more pushed out. But this exact needle, I'm quite sure it is a very difficult space to, 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 to live in. But at the same time, I have the impression now it fits to this idea of endlessness, of concept, of, uh, of, of the sea. And these two totally different spaces, they meet at this point with the strongest <coughs> immediate, with the strong, very immediate, you know, there is no übergang, there is no call it procedure from one to one, one to the other. It's an immediate going from one condition to the next condition. This building has something else that I find very important. It has here a fire. A cheminée. And I think that this fire is kind of the soul or the tranquility. And it's also the, the space that actually connects the three most important space, the stone space, the concept space, and here also the entry space on the right. Okay. This is the closer up, so on the right you have whatever kind of sleeping room. And you will also, you can go down actually next and go into kind of an atelier working space and a garage. And also actually from this garage you go up into the house next. <laughs> this is a uh, first trial of how we imagine this, uh, this concept space where I don't know how, you know, like how, how hardly it should stay half, half a circle. So I'm thinking around to eventually also introduce some elements to soft it again down. Next. And this is a view of the stone space. Huh? Next. Next. Um, this is the next house we are doing <coughs> in half of ten. So that's also kind of a uh, and a countryside situation in Turkey. Next. And he owns this little street house. The problem of this house is that the ceilings are at one, between 160 <coughs> and 170. So you can actually not walk in one single floor. And uh, Fabian, the guy that owns it, actually likes the house very much from the appearance. He loves this kind of, <coughs> that this, 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 the expression of this house, somehow so, so old or so, with kind of not contemporary, so simple, so absichtslos, kind of intentional. And uh, so, and actually, I like it too. So, what we propose to do is to, and there's maybe another thing that you have to understand, it's, it's two houses with a 
shape like this. How do you call this? Uh, pitch roof. Huh? Pitch roof like this, and the other one has a pitch roof like this. And since it's so old, I think it's around 500 years old, and you don't see it around this picture, this roof kind of bends through. It's all of this sort of moves. I don't know how to do it. It settles down. <coughs> and what we propose is to actually use exactly this building as a as a kofrash. Uh, we just pour concrete onto the wall and on, to, on top of the seat of, of the roof. So we just try to, to capture this beautiful form. And then once the concrete is done, we take out the wood and <coughs> outside we put insulation and then wood so it does not have this Expression towards outside. So towards outside, it would just look like a normal uh, wooden barn, contemporary wooden barn. The inside, it would produce a super crazy space. It would kind of produce like a church, because we will we'll just make a one space room basically. Because you suddenly have a little shift, you know, like the shift, how do you call it in English? Nave. or Nave. That is, you know, this centrality in this direction, so here. And then, on the other hand, here. And we will only produce some very small sleeping rooms. Actually, sleeping rooms will be in this area, more or less in uh, here. Also with a mini kitchen, and just we could just sleep in there, or just go in, that's it. And uh, the big space is actually also not really insulated, we will do it in insulation concrete, but only 30 centimeters. So it means kind of a temp only a tempered room, huh? It will not have a heating system. Next. And uh, so this is principally the model of, of, of what was going to happen. And I thought kind of a real man needs a real entry. <laughs> so, it's actually the only thing I will add. And I want him to enter the building from here. He has this plate, we do it in concrete. And this is a pillar I found in, in, in an old building in Kazakhstan that I find extremely beautiful. And so it will be kind of a concrete pillar that holds <coughs> on this, <coughs> sorry, this height still holds, and then the pillar will just go up another seven meters into into the nothingness or into the sleeping or whatever. This is a picture huh, of this uh, main space <coughs> with a quite large window which goes towards south and I hope that most of the energy you can already heat this building up. Uh, next, yeah, this is the window. Next, I don't know if it's finished. Ah, yeah. So, Tanikawa House, Shinohaga built this building, it's actually quite, I mean, it, I steal a lot from good architects, of course, and Shinohaga built a house which is basically this area, from here to here, which is more or less kind of a ground floor where you can eat and so, and then you go up and you can sleep. That's it. And about three-thirds, three-fourths of the space is kind of a useless space. It's a space that, we, we, that has no function, he calls it simply summer space. So it's all this space here, and this is a section through this area. So in this area, it, this, this, this space is 
it's about nature or it's about the surrounding, because the earth, because it's housing us as much like a pond, as like uh, it goes down. So he just continues it huh, in the house. You kind of cannot really use this space. It's just a space that is somehow covered, conserved, fixed, and that's it. the picture of this space. <coughs> Next. Okay. This is a house, you have to know when you study Shinohara, he has kind of four periods. And the further he goes, the more, for my impression, complicated he becomes. And uh, this... Uh, one building is a house in, uh, it houses in Tokyo, it's a university building. And I would like to give you one interpretation of this. That is, I have no clue what Shinohara thinks about it. But I would like to show you one aspect that I like very much. So, this thing next to all its uh, postmodern expression, it has four floors. The ground floor, when I was there, maybe it was different when you were there, the ground floor is a fucking man. I thought. Some pillars somewhere, you see the lüftung, you know, like the tubes upstairs. Uh, the openings are a bit somewhere, the shade is a bit somewhere. I found not super messed, it's true, just a bit disordered. A bit like life, I find, just a bit messy. And I find the top floor is the opposite. It's a very clear space. <coughs> of course, with this kind of this banana shaped space, but in section it's round. This is a space that has only at the very start and at the very beginning a glass uh, a window. So actually when you're in the space you're just nicely, you know, like holed by the walls and as soon as you approach the, la the, the, the periphery, so the end of the banana, you see onto <coughs> Tokyo. Now, what I like very much is when you're on the top, Tokyo is a quite chaotic city, you know, there's lots of bits and pieces. When you're on the top, you start to see Tokyo, you start to somehow understand Tokyo in a way that you can never do when you're on ground floor, because you're constantly, you know, if you walk through Tokyo, you have constantly alleys and roads and, and so on. You can kind of only understand Tokyo of its urban tissue when you lift yourself up and you look at it. So I would say the top floor is the space where you can kind of understand Tokyo or start to understand Tokyo. But at the same time, you cannot understand Tokyo because you're not part of it. And I find this is a <coughs> phenomenon that we have quite often in life. Either we can look at something and kind of understand it, but we are away of, of, its, of its reality. Or, and this is the other condition in this building, you are on ground floor, it's a mess, and you're part of life. So I like this contradiction. I find actually both are absolute spaces. In one, you are part of a kind of a physical reality of the city you don't understand it. On the top, you understand it, but you are not part of the, of the reality. You only look at it. Next so this is a picture of the entry floor. I find it not super chaotic, but relatively chaotic. If things are somewhere, you also don't really see outside, you see fragments. Next one. And then this is the top space, huh? where you see where you have these windows at the end, next. 
And I find this also a very important picture. You almost have, I find you almost see this thing, you know, that somehow looks at this Tokyo <coughs> from the train station. It's almost watching in, in, into this little, in the, into this multitude of lights that happen on ground floor. Next one. Um, there's one more topic that in my work is important that Shinohara makes almost in an excellent way. <coughs> it is the question of, you know, how that if you, when you build it as an architect, do you produce clay? Do you add clay? Or do you produce volumes? <coughs> and I find Shinohara brings this to the absolute point. So we have here this place that even maybe with sort of some postmodern ideas, but they even dissolve kind of into forms, huh? into triangles, rectangles, squares. It's a complete building of where you add plates, where you add stuff to, pro to produce a total. Next one. But then when you're in it, I find this, this he has constantly this flip between um, addition of plates and uh, spatial, uh, sp spatiality. Next. For example, also here, a view into another pillar. It's kind of plates, but it's also a, a, a continuous uh, organism or a continuous space. Next. Next. Um, this is another, I find, very difficult project. It's a competition in 1980, I think, in, uh, in Germany. And it is striking to see this man, he was born at 25 or 26, after all this extreme complex <coughs> of formal stuff, he ended up with a building that is so simple, or so symbolic, so without details. And I want to show it because I think Shinohara and Gary are the only two architects that were able to produce a liberation, to suddenly be free of all the, sh of all the stuff. And I find this building shows, I find almost like in the same way, you know, when you suddenly <coughs> don't start to care about anything anymore, you just become extremely free. So for me, this building is kind of when Gary calls architecture a fish, this for me is, is as radical in the, you know, in the understanding of architecture. Next. Um, Shinohara, maybe I have to quickly go back. Shinohara stopped architecture, I think, in the 80s. And I think he was more or less 65 or something. And he stopped producing, he stopped working at the university, and he didn't publish anymore. And in 2006, 2005, he made one last work, this house. And it's actually for the same client the way he already built uh, the house with the earth and house in Uehega, the same family. And I don't know if this building is built or not, but I find it from many levels maybe one of his most concentrated, con most concentrated buildings when he brought all <coughs> practice together in one little simple building. So <coughs> this is a building with a pitch roof, it's on a slope, and 
he doesn't put the building parallel to the slope, so, but he slightly turns it. The slight turn produces that in the ground floor here, the earth, notice the, 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 uh, here you see, the terra enters also. So, part of the space is kind of this symbolic space, huh? space with no function. Ground floor it is here. By turning also, he manages to adapt to the terra, so he can just enter here uh, with the door and just produce enough uh, space for the window in the toilet, which is when you go down the stairs, down here. <coughs> it also has this appearance of symbolic structure that I showed only one picture, but it's actually an entire work on this uh, symbolic structure. We have a beam, a kind of two beams, one, two, strangely, one here and one here. We have a little sleeping room or tea room or something, just a, a room to go away of the main space. It is when you take the ladder, the la la ladder, I don't know how to say, step up here, and as a consequence, you end up in this space here. Also, the first time he kind of makes, he splits the space not according to geometry, not according to construction, but according to geometry. He puts this hole that the outside is in the real geometry center and not the structure. So again, Shinohara is never really about construction, or it's also never really about function. It's constantly about trying <coughs> to give things a meaning. Shinohara died 206 when he made his plans and Somebody feels the urge to ask one or two questions. I would do it. I would not do more. Please, please uh, take the opportunity. Is there anybody from the, from the public who would like to? Nobody dares. No, maybe I would like to ask one very short question. How did you decide which buildings you know, are to show and which ones not to show? Yeah, I realized that it would be quite a uh, difficult work to do this. And I had too little time, so I decided to just choose out of my belly. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Once that I saw emotion, I went through the book and I thought about this, you know, I. I the moment there in Poland. Maybe a question related to that. Shinohara, of course, you look at a work which is complete. There's a beginning, there's an end. And it also ends with his end. Of course, you are related to his work. Like also, of course, you're related to other work. Mm. I mean, you simplify, obviously, the fact that you <coughs> have work. I mean, how do you deal with that when you go through the whole lifespan of it? Because of course you see all the time, I mean you see a move, and you see a counter move, you see the next move. And of course when you make a project, you make a project now, and you're not necessarily already prepared to do the next moving relationship. How do you see that? You know, I don't, 
I don't really, I think, I don't really react to him so consciously or some so strategically or you know, so willingly. I, I, I have the impression I work more like lots of stuff in my head and I start and then somehow something pops up and usually I like it and then I want to fight it. Kind of not do it, but I like it. So I'm quite often in this, uh, in this dilemma of, of getting rid of what I like or to, 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 to somehow oppose to, to the stuff that I like, to include it, but also to exclude it. And, you know, I think I have this relation with kind of almost all architects, or maybe the more architects I find interesting, kind of to in so one way get inspired, but also in one way to kind of to kill them. So that's and how so you, you talked about in the way how he was maybe not about structure. Mm -hmm. Maybe I extrapolate and I would argue, is it maybe also not about honesty? So yeah. It's honesty, yeah. in yeah. how important is that in your work? Not to be honest. I find that to be quite very important. I have the impression all this works, I do. Never, in the end, it's very honest. It's honest. Yeah. It's not about this honest. No, it's very honest. <coughs> yeah. Because you could interpret it the way around. Yeah, but I'm not at all, let's say, a player. I don't know, you know, like to, to make a game out of it. You should be very, very close and intimate with the different kinds of Any question related to that, perhaps? Also, it's emotionally honest, not that factor is honest. Right? Mm -hmm. You ask factor, it is honest, and it's also emotionally honest. Yeah, it's emotionally honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can we say thanks a lot?
He was not a nice guy, really. But I guess all this other generation kind of had a deep respect, but also wanted to get rid of him at the same time. And I would say also, I mean, when you go to Japan, you talk on Shimohara, you would say everybody is negative. That's what was my experience. Finally, for example, I had to chat with Go quite long on this question. Yeah. And he actually, at the, he would actually get those in chains. Just a reaction. The reaction of him is not that they seriously criticize. You know, let's take a deal thing. A way to deal with this. Maybe a last question. Do the link, the most recent building, the 80s building, you show, you, you mentioned sometimes you say, yeah, maybe a bit post modern. Mm -hmm. I noticed that it's a struggle. It's a, I mean, is it important? No, it's of no importance to me in this world at the moment. If the problem is if you look at this uh, centennial hall, most people just see somehow it looks a bit post modern. And I think, yes, it does, but the power for me is in a, it's another topic. I, I would argue it doesn't look more, more postmodern than, say, early or No, no. It's the same, no? No, no, the same yeah. era. no. No, right. Somehow, again, I would say even more much, more power. I mean, not as critique, yeah. but uh, uh, more direct. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks.